In life, there are some people who are just plain cool. And I don't just say this from personal experience. Well, cameraman, it appears you changed my text tone. Luckily, I am so cool that I am not mortified in the slightest. And I will just turn this off. And you want to know what else is cool? Today's interview subject, MTG artist Adam Paquette. Whatever it is, he has it. That X factor, that je ne sais quoi. It also does not hurt that he is massively talented and has an Australian accent. Oh God, I love those accents. But let's get to that artistic wonder from down under. It is good. What what's going on? What what is that, that room you're in? What's what is that? That's crazy looking. Oh, I have um, I have a. Hang on, let me see if I can just unplug you and show you around a little bit. Might lose you for a second. Still there? Yeah, I am here. So so I have um, this is the upstairs of my studio. I have like a kind of mezzanine up here, where I do uh, yeah kind of digital work magic stuff. And then the rest of my studio is uh, down here. And so I have like quite a big space down there. And then the rest is shared with other artists. So it's like a really big, it's a really big long space. Do you guys have, like, have a, like a, you all live together? Like it's a like it's roommates? It's not a living or... space. No, no, it's not a living space. It's just a workspace. There's about 12 artists in here. Oh. Um, from okay. all different all different um, fields. There's like tape artists and digital artists and all sorts of stuff. And were those the magic originals that I saw hanging on the walls? Uh, they they shouldn't be. <laughs> One sec. Oh. Uh, no, no, none of those are magic. They're all just okay. personal art. So, because they look like lands. Are they lands? Uh, yeah, I do. I do also a lot of landscape work for, for myself. So there's a couple of lands. Oh, well, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah, no problem at all. Great to be here. Okay, so um, you say you grew up around professional storytellers. What what does that mean? So um, yeah, it was um, my my mom when I was growing up um, actually used to do sort of cultural liaison work, and we would host um, people from different parts of the world. Some some like tribal elders and. Uh, actually just a bunch of really interesting people from different parts of the world when I was young. And so they would, when they were coming to Australia to give talks or, or visit, um, do different things uh, around, they would come and stay at our place and, um, you know, for maybe a week or two at a time. And so when I was five or six, I was, you know, sharing the living room with, with these people that were often professional or just lifelong um, storytellers and embedded in that craft of storytelling. So um, kind of growing up uh, around that and also spending a lot of time uh, when I was young going back and forth between Australia and India. And when I was living in India, um, my mom would go off and study during the day and she would leave me with um, friends and, and people in the village. And again, like I would just go and sit under the trees and there would be this kind of culture of of not necessarily storytelling, but um, talking story and, and kind of sharing in that communal um, conversation. So, yeah, I think that was kind of the foundation of my um, imaginative background, let's say, it was not so much pop culture, um, although, of course, that was part of my childhood as well. But it was really that storytelling and imagination came from this foundation of a, of a spiritual tradition or a cultural tradition, and that it was, um, yeah, kind of a natural extension of that rather than a cultural product put on top of of kind of the base culture, you know. So you and you moved out to a bunch of different places, and then so mm -hmm. in around I think around high school you or you had you had thought you wanted to do uh, writing. And then you switched to art. Had, mm -hmm. how, how long had you been doing art, though, as far as like, when did you first pick up, you know, a crayon and mm -hmm. like, did, you know, something along those lines where you, you were actively tackling art? What was the earliest age? So I, I think actively tackling is the is the key part of the question, because I I had never really. And for a long time afterwards, I wasn't a naturally passionate mark maker. 
I wasn't one of these artists that really got excited by the act of drawing or painting. And I know a lot of, um, a lot of people who do like, that's the main source of pleasure for them is just the kind of meditative act of, of the painting itself. Um, but for me, it was always related to concept or related to narrative or related to some kind of linguistically framed idea, even when I was too young to, to realize the difference. So I, you know, I was doodling and sketching as a kid as, as much as any kid was, but there was always the beginning of, of the process would always be writing a story, it would always be world, some kind of world building or coming up with a story. And then the illustration or the drawing would be serving that. Um, and I, I found it a lot more fluid to generate ideas in the written form in, in, I guess, in a linear time-based form where I could sort of imply meaning and progression and change, um, than to just enjoy the beauty of a painting in and of itself. And so even now, especially in my personal work, also in magic, but I guess in magic, it's a bit more defined by the structure of the job, but especially in my personal work, um, if I don't go to my journal and write and read about things that are relevant to the paintings I'm working on, and I just try to work on an aesthetic piece, uh, I very rarely follow through. And if I get stuck on something, it's usually going back to some kind of reading, writing, um, self-critique, philosophical judgment of the work that's going to get me kind of interested again and back on track. It's interesting. So you, 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 that's how you, you can use that for stopping sort of like writer's block, except it's artist blocks. It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And it's funny because, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, um, a lot of people would say that the point of painting or one of the, one of the unique things that painting can do is transcend verbal language which dominates so much of the culture right and that and that maybe the most powerful paintings um, are the ones that can't be put into words or the ones that transcend the kind of language center of the brain so i feel a, a bit of um, um like i should elevate painting to that level where it goes beyond what i can put into words but at the same time the most um powerful and personal experiences that i've had from a piece of art were generally from from pieces of writing not from paintings so it's really? a strange thing it's a strange thing to be so so captivated by the written word but find myself living my life as a painter and i think it's just a way for me to kind of sublimate language into painting because i think that i enjoy the interactivity of being a visual artist much more so i do a lot of sketching in public and a lot of my personal work has to do with where I actually do the work and how other people relate with that. Um, and, you know, you can't sit in a cafe writing a novel and expect the person next to you to kind of lean over and be like, Hey, can I, can I read your can chapter? I, you know, yeah. so they can look Nobody, at your sketchbook and get excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> never in the history of writing has anybody ever said, can I read what you're writing? <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would have to be Stephen King, right? You'd have to uh -huh. like, then you'd be like, maybe I'd be interested to see you know, some massively <laughs> yeah. successful person, but that's, that's, that's really cool. So, Okay, that makes sense. You know, Tori Amos once said that she sees herself as a sonic architect. And so that makes sense. You're taking the written word, but translating it into a form of art, is basically mm -hmm. what you're saying. So then how do you, then how do you, okay, for instance, when you get a brief for from Wizards of the Coast, like, how how does that, does that mean, is that just a natural fit for you? Because it's it's a written word and then you're, you're taking it somewhere else. I mean, how do you... Um, how do you deal with art direction and, and what what makes interesting dark direction? Yeah, so I think I think it's um it it cuts both ways because yes, it's a natural fit because it's coming from a language-based brief and also uh, an explicitly narrative um, underpinning for the image, both in its self-contained sense and also in how it connects to the rest of the, the set, the universe whatever's going on in the world of magic at the time. Um, so in that sense, it's a natural fit, but it also takes away that, that most important foundation from being under my control, right? So I'm working with someone else's linguistic and, and narrative turns. So I think what makes it interesting for me is whether I can 
come to that with my own resistance or or a kind of deviation that takes it in an interesting turn um so i guess once i was at a point where i was comfortable enough with magic and my place in the um, in the company that i could start to take risks it was really about not going for the most obvious solution and deciding how i could kind of push things in a in an interesting way and in at the end of the day a lot of the time if i look in retrospect it's not really such a risk that i took it's more that when i read a brief I already see in my head what it should look like as a magic card based on on all of the other magic cards I've seen. And I kind of get a sense of what I think the obvious solution would be from a general, like if any old magic artist was to have a crack at this, this is probably the angle that they would choose, the, the framing they would choose. And so to kind of push up against that and do something, um, yeah, a little bit counterintuitive is enjoyable um there isn't so much room in magic to really like inject a lot of your own kind of philosophical you know gravitas sort of stuff in there although every now and then there are um, there are definitely satisfying moments or or just yeah choices more so than the structure of the whole image but just certain choices of what's left in what's left out um that that feel more connected to how i felt at the time and what i wanted to paint than to solving a brief, which is the main feeling of being an illustrator is, is problem solving. Now you bring up an interesting uh, thing is, um, what are some examples of the uh, satisfying things that, that have injected the, the personal aspects? Because I read that you, um, you said at the beginning that you would often put, uh, try to put a lot of your personality into the earlier pieces. And as you've gotten further and further with your career, you've realized that it's better to leave those to mm -hmm your own works. So what are some examples of like in magic where you injected yourself into it that really felt like it hit home for you? I think the, I think the experience that I remember from the earlier work also in, in D and D before I jumped over to magic was a level of immersion in the environment work that was, um, that was really like a projection of myself into the space. And I remember that, that feeling of kind of sketching something out and then really creating pathways, literal pathways into the image, roads going in, paths going in. Like I was very focused on staircases and doorways and bridges and things that I could kind of like imagine into and, mm. and really see myself walking through the space. Um, and I, I found that in the end, those compositions tended to look a little bit like screenshots from a game or, or kind of like film composition. Yeah, more like screenshots from a game, like something where you're kind of at eye height and it was a little bit too diagrammatic. It was a little bit too kind of like, here's a whole panorama of a city and you can kind of see all the details of every building and project into that. And I think that came from my kind of childhood as, you know, loving the, the sand pit and building whole cities you know, in the sand when I was a kid and then this kind of world building writing thing that I was into. And then it became less and less satisfying um, to, to not have a more cinematic or a more graphic approach to the illustration because I was looking at more painterly painters and I was like, okay, they're not showing everything like a map, like a, like a kind of two dimensional side scroll, a video game showing every, everywhere that you can go. Um, and so I started leaning much more into kind of the more expressive graphic design oriented aspects of painting. So the, for instance, the one behind you um, at the moment, you know, is much more of a like, how can I play just with pure overlapping circles on a flat background? Like it's, it was coming much more from um, a period of time when I was looking at abstract expressionism and Rothko and Pollock and de Kooning. And, you know, I was much more interested in like flat graphic work than in this kind of immersive concept arty sort of stuff. Right. What's, um, what were some examples? Because I also had read that you said that it's really great and helpful when the art directors give you paintings to, to sort of... Um, use for ideas to when you're creating it um were there any paintings that you've worked on for the pieces you've worked on that directly uh did that for you that created a line of inspiration uh you mean you mean paintings from outside of magic that have that have served as inspiration for magic paintings yes yeah i think you had said that in an interview um you know i think 
I think not specific. I mean, there, there must be there must be specific paintings, but it was more of like general phases of periods of painting that I was interested uh. in that I went through. And so there was like, you know, the the Hudson Valley School for a long time, and you can see that in the um, in the kind of like Innistrad plains and things like that. These kind of sweeping valleys with very um, kind of Turner esque clouds and that sort of stuff. And then I got more into um, kind of like Russian social realism or Soroya, like Spanish uh, realist painting. And that, that was kind of more of an introduction into interest in the figure. But um, yeah, I, I think for a long time, it was just a lot of 19th century landscape painting and Russian landscape painting, Isaac Levitan, Ilya Repin, these kind of people that I can't point to specific paintings, but I think if you were to kind of look at my landscape work and those side by side, it would be pretty obvious the kind of, um, you know, the, the way that they were evoking mood and space, it wasn't some analytical process where I decoded the way that they did it and tried to redo it in magic. It was just the feeling that it gave me to look at those paintings was something that I tried to spontaneously translate into, into magic landscapes. And I think probably the most important break for me in magic was, um, you know, going from being a landscape guy to kind of anything guy. And I was doing other work as well. In the beginning, I, I was doing creatures, occasionally characters, but, um, it was more difficult for me and it was kind of, it was never really the focus of my work. And then at some point I started to kind of consciously tackle these different, uh, different briefs and, and also the briefs from magic started to get more complicated and sagas started coming out and there was like weird formats and these kinds of things going on. But um, so, so it kind of, I guess my influences exploded a little bit um, in that period, but yeah, I think the early work, definitely 19th century Russian landscape painters and yeah. And what's cool too, is you, you, you sort of do like the same locations um, in, in different sets, like, it, but it's like from a, a different kind of like perspective or different time of day. And mm -hmm. it's, how do you, I mean, how do you do that if there's not a, I mean, do you just then take the painting that you've done and then like sort of try to reproduce it? Cause you don't have like a, a reference photo, so to sort of, so to speak. And, and how do you, consciously determine what's going to like be uh you know something that looks good in another photo is or do you even know that ahead of time when you're going to do it i i work really um i i don't have a traditional planning process of of a lot of the kind of illustrators of the generation before me that would you know sketch it out solve the problems do a drawing and and i've done that process before and I'm really jealous of them because it makes it so much easier to know where you're going, you know, but um, beginning also because I began predominantly as a digital artist, the, the main strength of digital work is its flexibility. And so I was using a lot of kind of like layering and photo bashing and stuff like that. Not, not in the way that some people do, which is like, I need a tree, I'm going to photo bash a tree in, but I would, you know, do a kind of atmospheric sketch. And then I would get a photo of, anything like an oyster a piece of meat some foam like random things with interesting texture and interesting um like tonal range or interesting color so maybe like a like um like an oil spill for instance would have like really interesting texture and color and i would just put that over as a layer on 10 percent over the whole painting and kind of pick huh. out areas that look interesting erase that out and be like, yeah, that kind of gives me a sense of where these clouds might kind of push back or come forward. And so it wasn't, it wasn't kind of like putting a photo of a cloud in to make a cloud. It was just like allowing that kind of Rorschach free association thing to keep playing out. And so I still do a lot of that, like an area starts to look a bit flat and boring. I'll just do some brushwork or some texture over the top, randomize it a bit, and then go back in and pull out the things that are interesting for me. That's uh, that's actually a really interesting way to go about it, and I'd, I'd imagine it keeps things really fresh as far as like not becoming uh, redundant or maybe feeling trapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the probably the downside of it is that because you're introducing a lot of detail in the texture itself, is that there's there's a need to go in and then really render it out to kind of get rid of that the flattening that effect that that has. 
so you know considering that most of the time magic cards are printed on these tiny pieces of paper and yes sometimes they're wallpapers sometimes they're used in advertising but generally speaking um you know i think a lot of magic artists try to be very economical about the way that they paint and keep things quite simple and graphic so that they read well on the card the the downside of this kind of overly layered approach is that um it can require going in and doing a lot of rendering because i see you know i might do like a basic silhouette of a tree and then slap a texture of like meat over the top and it gives me all these interesting kind of curls and nodding shapes but then I need to go in and actually render out these things that I see and correct the lighting and give it form and dimension. So I maybe make it a bit too complicated for myself, or I maybe yeah. make the image a bit too dense and then I need to simplify it again. So it's not a very economical way of working, but it is, um, I think brings a lot of beauty to it. And it's, it is the hypnotic and fun part of painting, which is like when it clicks and your, and your eye starts to see where the light should fall you kind of get into this automatic process that can be very enjoyable where you're just kind of like, uh, you know, Michelangelo on the block of marble. Like you see the thing and you're just kind of like chiseling it out until it kind of clicks. Hard to describe, but yeah. 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 It's, um, it's fascinating. It's, it's fascinating how you work. And then also well, I think there was sort of like an interesting jump. Now, I don't know if you started doing 3d stuff around the unset, but I feel like the unset lands sort of, kicked open the door for you to go just like all out wild with some of the designs that you've done and they're great stuff it's just these these crazy spirals and these like angles that are almost dizzying um what what um what around what time did you start you know really incorporating that into your work 3d mm -hmm. um i've been i mean i've been using blender forever but it it was um like what's what's the earliest one I can remember? Like I think even as far back as like something like glaring spotlight. I know Spire Bluff Canal. I did I did a pretty like solid 3D on that, but it was really for a very long time. All I really knew how to do was lay in the geometry and some light sources, and I was kind of building a black and white maquette, and then I was layering my kind of textures and things over the top of that. It's probably only in the last two years, two and a half years, three years maybe, that I've actually actually got my head around Blender properly and materials and node-based rendering and stuff like that. And so there are some some pieces. I'm I'm so bad at like remembering my own pieces. But it's okay if you there, if you there, are, there are some pieces that are that are like heavily um, based on the on the 3D to the point of like needing to go back in and paint out the 3dness of it and make it look like a painting again because it was already kind of done you know oh okay huh. yeah and I it's wish better, I, but i think wish... it's i think it's really important that that the paintings are paintings and that they're not just 3d renderings the exception being um carving the um, the, the saga for kaldheim out of wood right. and photographing it <laughs> you know that one was like i want to leave that as a photograph and i find it really interesting that i'm allowed to do that but otherwise, I think a painting should look like a painting, not not like a three D rendering. The story behind that one. What is the story behind that one? I I I, I feel like it's got its quarantine. it's got its own saga. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a, that was a quarantine choice. <laughs> and yeah, was, um, uh, was it difficult? I mean, it looks so cool. Yeah, it was. It was basically, uh, you know, I, I have a Discord group with a bunch of with a bunch of other artists, and they, you know, we were kind of joking about how how over the top the sagas can be and wouldn't it be funny if you know someone actually cast this thing in metal or whatever and and um i forget who it was, was it maybe, victor maybe victor time. yeah it could yeah it was victor it was victor kind of like egged me on to do it and and actually carve the thing and um yeah and so i i was like you know i'll give it a shot i'll probably get halfway through and do sort of a basic carving and then take it into digital and finish it and then yeah when i was kind of a quarter of the way through the process, um, COVID happened and, and I realized that I had to move out of my studio and do lockdown at home. And so I decided to just take everything home and, you know, hunkered, hunkered down in my, in my spare room and terrorize my neighbors with the sound of carving at three in the morning and oh, Lord. I don't know how many, how many hours I spent on that. But, you know, it was the first time I'd ever done a wood carving. So I was learning as I went and making mistakes and 
super gluing you know pieces back on that i was chipping off and all of that kind of stuff so it was, it was super fun yeah yeah it's um it, when i when i interviewed victor he said he did it as sort of like a, a bluff and then when you did it he was like oh, crap <laughs> exactly i gotta do one too and but it's it is i mean and do you think that you'll do stuff like that in the future is that or is that something that's so labor intensive you just you can't manage it it's more just like i have no idea what's going to come up so you mm-hmm. know I, I can't really predict um i mean i i did another i did another painting recently that that is kind of i would say not to the same degree of uniqueness but i think that it's a very kind of like pushes on the edge of what painting is for me um and that's that's going to be pretty exciting to share when that comes out but I mean, you know, I think I think the only thing that stops me is that I have a lot of stuff that I want to do in my in my personal work, in my own um, in my in my non commercial art practice. And I think that, um, you know, I've been doing magic since 2008 or nine, 2009, I think. And, you know, eventually you want to put that energy into into other stuff. And it's very addictive to to get a new brief, to get really excited about it and to want to, you know, take your work to the next level, put all of your energy into it. Um, but I think you have to be really careful about managing that balance if you, if you want to continue, you know, your career and and, until you're, until the, the, the kind of height of your career, I think you need to balance, um, with, with the energy of personal work to sustain that. And I, and I had other illustrators when I was just 20 and getting into this field that, that said that, that were like very explicit about that. And they were like, you know protect protect your energy like it is a job it is a company that's like they they want the work and it's just going to keep coming and it's going to be you that has to say like i need to take a break i need to wind this down um and i yeah i got some really some really honest advice from illustrators about you know not not giving the the most precious best things of yourself away um also because they're they're often not needed you know they're often not like it's not essential that you pour 300 hours into this painting um, as, as you might do for something that's, that's deeply personal. So um, yeah, but I, but I, I, I have, um, I have a real desire to, to please with my work. I think I'm very, very excited about getting an, a, a good response from fans from, from magic. So I tend to kind of put a lot of myself into my work and so, you know, it's just about knowing when to when to slow that down. So the answer to your question is probably yes. If I get a if I, if I get a brief that um, that tempts me in that direction, I'll probably try and one up myself again. Um, but who knows? Who knows what's now, what's in the pipe? Now the jumpstart lands also are a couple of, like things that I wanted to point out. Now those are mm-hmm. those are crazy. Um, what, were those the art briefs that made them look like that, or were you? I mean, they're they're just they're they're like they're so bizarre and fun uh these are the these are the the vertical ones you mean well the ones that were like there's a swamp with an eyeball in it and uh there's ah, uh, okay the, these ones yeah the 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 deer the deer one and with the, the yeah, venus yeah. fly traps uh they, yeah that was all, that was all in the briefs really um, okay mm-hmm. that was um yeah pretty pretty much none of that was me being super inventive that was that was all on magic creative and and I, they were pretty much as i got them yeah and that's that would still i mean i guess it's a testament to your abilities if they're giving you stuff that like is that has so many different elements of like different aspects of like you know characters and design that kind of stuff um and what's interesting too is that you um you in your beginning of your career you you didn't feel comfortable doing um characters and and yet, uh, as you've gone on, uh, you've had some like really significant success as far as no- getting noticed with your characters. Like you were the cover art for Battle Bond, and oh, one of your characters was chosen for Spectrum. Um, mm-hmm. Do you feel more confident now with your character work? Um, yes, I I do. Like I still have a weird thing in the back of my head that says like you're not you're not a character artist and that's because I'm comparing myself to the guys that are like banging out planeswalkers, you know, like one, one a week. So, you know, on a, on a kind of like, if I see myself just in the context of the stable of magic illustrators, I'm like, no, no, I'm a kind of a land guy and a bit of a generalist that can adapt to different things. I probably would associate myself as the person that they would call on when they need a really kind of 
tightly done panoramic, you know, wraparound cover that I did for for the Art of Magic books or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I step back and I and I just look at my work generally, I think it's because my my personal work has gone way in the direction of of um, figure based work over the last right, um, especially the period since I moved to Berlin in 2016. Uh, because my my personal work became almost entirely around dance and movement. Yes, uh, I was going to ask you. The music but... culture of Berlin, yeah. And of course, like, I'm not doing highly detailed rendered, um, you know, paintings. I'm actually doing really fast sketchbook work on the dance floor or in a in a yoga studio and this kind of stuff. So I'm doing this kind of, like, like the one behind me here, this sort of, mm-hmm. like, expressive pen and ink stuff but it is familiarizing me with the body and giving me much more of an interest in, um, in the expressive potential of the body. So yeah, I've, I've done uh, actually just yesterday, I finished some deadlines that were very, very, you know, down the line character work. Um, and it's, it's still a challenge for me. I find it exciting and I always find it surprising how much of a completely different language of painting it is to environment work like in the actual technical uh, way that you use kind of edges, the way that you use light, the way that you create depth. Um, it's really a, a completely different intention behind mark making. Um, do you, you, I read that you go to like, you go to dance clubs and you will take your, or your sketchbook and sketch people in this like private universe. Cause there's, they don't allow photography in the clubs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yet you you also feel like you have to keep it separate or keep it uh, sort of private because you you don't want to violate that world. But mm-hmm. at the same time, like I really want to see that. Is there any <laughs> yeah. way you could like maybe just put one or two out? Or <laughs> yeah, I mean I'm I am going to publish the work um, at at some point. It's just um, you know it's a it's a respect thing. It's um, you know Berlin's history of the queer community that built this in- incredible. Uh, world that they have in Berlin and um, um, yeah just wanting to like really respect the history and the and the privacy of that world um, it's not because anything that's in there is particularly outrageous or or um, you know would would get anyone upset if I shared it it's really just kind of precious like it's a very it's a very beautiful thing um, that that people would share with me so um, I just want to. I just want to do it right. I just want to do it justice. I want to publish it in a way that I feel is is very true and doesn't caricaturize it, which I feel some of the people that have tried to document the the Berlin uh, music world have kind of made it into a bit of a cartoon in the past and kind of focused on the the clothing and exaggeration of that world. And um, yeah, I just want to do it right. So partly it's it's a curatorial thing and partly i'm also just working on like bigger more ambitious paintings and things like that and i want to kind of release it in one go and and i think i was for a very long time trapped in what i think a lot of people are still trapped in which is the need to constantly share everything they're working on on social media and and be just like vomiting out sketchbook pages and um i've kind of taught myself not to do that and be a little bit more uh, restrained with what i share and yeah, it's nice because it's exciting then to feel like you have a big dump of kind of curated stuff ready to go that that has a clear message and a clear emotion behind it. Now, is there is this planned? Is this something that you is this big project? What is this big project you're talking about? Like, is the is there going to be like a collection of your stuff that you're putting out or are you allowed to talk about it? Yeah, it's a like it's a completely personal project. Um, it's it's it kind of has two intentions one is as something that i can publish that is um that is a a, a globally let's say globally accessible thing that will be interesting for anyone that's interested in my work and the other aspect of it is very very centered on on um, being locally framed for berlin and for that community which means the right the right building the right space the, the music that gets played when it's being exhibited performances, lighting, scale, installation, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a lot more ambitious and requires a lot more funding and you know all of this fine art world <laughs> stuff that I've had to learn. Um, the publishing side of it is more uh, a combination of like doc- the documentation, the sketchbook work, some more reflective artwork that's been done post hoc 
and also a lot of writing like essays and interviews and reflective writing on on that world um, and specifically you know it's not just um it's not just a a kind of documentary lens on something that I've seen. It's actually an investigation of the role of the artist in that space. And what does it mean to, to be a visual artist in a space that has restricted permissivity about the recording of images and, and all of the kind of interesting interpersonal, political, social things that go along with what is the role of being an artist in, in public? Do you think that there's an element of voyeurism in, in in what you do as an artist? Because even even when you think about, say, like with your sketching somebody, or even if you're doing a landscape, you're you're watching something that is not aware that you're watching. Um, where do you think that comes from? And do you think that that's something mm. that is part of your repertoire? Yeah, d d uh, yeah, definitely. I I think like mm, I think it's it's not voyeurism. It's it goes both ways. So it's more of a like, it's more of a, a desire to engage in a communication that is not a that that bypasses the presentation of a persona from one person to the other. So there's kind of an uneasy truce when because it's I'm not generally like you know hiding in the corner drawing someone without them being aware. I'm I'm pretty obviously showing them that I'm drawing them, but I'm doing it in a way that's kind of i'm talking more specifically about kind of in clubs and and different environment like also in cafes on the train whatever but um you know i'm doing it in a way that's making it very clear that i'm drawing someone so i can make sure that they're not uncomfortable with it and kind of give them the chance to leave if they're not interested in having that kind of um experience but then once that kind of permission is is sort of like non-verbally acknowledged and understood that that's what's happening i'm also pretty guarded about it and it's it's kind of like you know um you know this isn't this isn't flirting this isn't me trying to kind of make contact with you and expecting you to come over and be like oh wow you're drawing cool can i have a look it's really like okay there's a, there's a subject artist relationship here you know the, the best thing that that person can do is be like right he's drawing me I'm going to forget all about that and I'm really going to go into the dance. And then I'm like, great. Like this is someone that's happy to really get into that dancing experience and is happy for me to investigate that movement and the dance and the music. And it's like, wow, when that really works, it's a, it's a, it's a real gift actually. And, and a lot of the time, in fact, you know, people have come over afterwards and, spoken to me about the experience of being drawn and how much it helped them focus and it was really interesting and sometimes they don't even ask to see the drawing just really like, yeah, i really enjoyed that experience you know i'm going to go back to the dance floor see you later it's like wow cool you know like that's actually more interesting for me than th this kind of like showing the sketchbook like oh wow you're an artist cool you know that that sort of response is a bit routine i guess I, I see what you're saying. So, because when you were drawing somebody and they're aware that you're drawing them, you're also in a position where if somebody were to draw you, it would be like you would be in doing an act of living that you're doing as well. Like you're you're mm -hmm. in the moment, they're in the moment, as opposed to you know, uh, just I guess I, I guess when I said voyeur, it was just a sense of just you were a very watcher. You're you're a big watcher of things. Yeah, I think I think it's really like the feeling that I get is. Um, I don't know when I when I hear voyeur, I think like you know someone someone looking through the window creepily, you know. So it's not that kind of like I'm not trying to remove myself and sort of stay in a privileged position where I get to look at something that isn't aware that I'm looking. It's more of a kind of anim, animal sort of interaction where kind of like two two lions kind of like lock eyes and kind of size each other up and they're kind of you know orienting themselves to each other's body language and and the, the context around them. And there's just a kind of nonverbal communicative interactive thing that happens. And that I find that interaction um, very deeply human in a way that maybe we forget because we've got so many tools at our disposal to like present the person that we want to present ourselves as to manipulate each other through language, to impress each other, to whatever. So to kind of remove that, ability to dialogue and just be doing it i mean you know for for dancers it's this times a million right like they can actually meet and just with their bodies have that communication right i'm still sort of doing a mental process but it's that kind of thing 
yeah exactly yeah it's it's so that's that's that again it's very interesting and you know i i I wouldn't call you a warrior but i do want to know the story behind dave palumbo's panties uh i read something about that and i wasn't sure what the story was so i wanted to hear that that story dave palumbo's panties you posted something about that on your blog and it's it was uh, a painting that arrived of panties i think it was and it had to do with him uh ah, oh god that was years ago years and years <laughs> ago yeah i think he was just doing there's no real story behind that if i remember correctly he was doing like very quick daily paintings i think to pay for parking fines <laughs> like i think that i think that like they put a bunch of parking meters in his neighborhood and he kept getting parking fines so he would do these quick paintings to like, and then sell them for fifty dollars or whatever the parking fine was. So yeah, there's, there's no more story than than that. I don't know what I wrote in the blog post, but you were like, "I'm so glad to have gotten Dave Flumbo's panties," and I'm like, "Well, that's an interesting statement." It... <laughs> no, no, I I did not steal or receive as a gift officially any of Dave Palumbo's actual panties. <laughs> so, um, what's what as far as concept pushes? Um, you hmm. you do seem to be involved in that um a lot, and what. I, I'm always fascinated behind the scenes, like what goes into a concept push? Like if you have like an interesting anecdote of where that happens, like something hmm. c- cool that, that you've done that you know where you were part of. I mean, I think that's, that again, comes back to that love of world building that I've had since, since I was young. And it's, it's also one of the more difficult experiences with magic because it really is um the the biggest challenge in in like self limiting how far that can go because as any you know fantasy writer or, or or any any person who loves world building will know like it can just go forever and you think that you're you know going to be the next Tolkien or you know Frank Herbert or whoever and it's like no like this is a, this is a product like we have to remember that that what we're doing here is not just designing a world for the sake of it with all of its you know, astrophysics and political systems and languages, like it's at the end of the day, we're creating a style guide that is a visual based thing that is going to help artists produce a set of magic cards. Um, So I think on on the Kaladesh concept push, I probably leaned into that a little bit because I spent so much time in India when I was young. I got really into like, how can we incorporate all of these philosophical ideas from Buddhism and Hinduism and all these symbols and all this architecture. And it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like this is just taking some of the essence of that culture and then spinning up our whole, you know, our own world from that, not leaning on it too heavily and certainly not kind of like ripping off the stories and and kind of just giving them a magic skin, you know? Um, So I think, yeah, I think concept pushes in the beginning can be like super exciting and it's just like page after page of ideas and possible directions. And then at some point it's like visual, like bring it back to visual language. Like how do we simplify that down to some basic rules that can then be applied by, you know, a hundred different artists with different styles in different types of paintings. Um, and that that's a really interesting kind of left brain part of the process where you have to um yeah kind of decode your own work and pull out the design language from that and communicate that very clearly like you know it's all this particular swirly curl shape or everything is very triangular or you know whatever those rules are for the set have you ever given it consideration to doing a graphic novel um not seriously no i I had like um I, I was going to say I, I still have an idea on the back burner, but it's been so long that I think it's it would need some serious witchcraft to resurrect it. But um, I was very interested in um, like Dinotopia was a real was a real kind of um, landmark influence for me when I was a kid, and mm-hmm. and also getting to meet getting to meet Jim, um, which was actually wow. at that was at the the illustration masterclass where I met Jeremy Jarvis, which is how I got into magic in the first place. Wow. Um, there was kind of like a big crashing together of a lot of things uh, Damn. for me in that, in that week. Um, but yeah, I was really more interested in that kind of like illustrated book rather than the paneled graphic novel. Um, and I'm still interested in the, in something that would be a flow between 
visual communication and written communication for obvious reasons of everything that I've been speaking about. But I think the um, I think the kind of gimmickiness of trying to force that interest that I have into the format of a graphic novel and the kind of world and the readership that comes along with that, like it feels like I'm trying to shoehorn too much of myself in into the format of the thing. Um, and it's kind of become sublimated into what I'm doing now, which is this kind of hybrid sketching, painting, writing on location in the studio. Like I'm already getting that combination um, of things that was the, the that was what made me interested in a graphic novel in the first place and the actual process of making a good graphic novel is you know as much of a specific skill set as when people ask me if i design tattoos and it's like no like you know you actually need to to understand how tattoos are done and how that that visual language works to be a good tattoo designer and it's not just about drawing right Right. I just figured because after looking at some of your journal entries, they 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 really have like they they have a sort of feel sometimes where they're you know with the writing and the images, and I'm I found I found myself going like, oh, what's next? And and I thought, mm. well, maybe because of your background in writing, that there was some sort of story that you had lying there in the in the wings that maybe has yet to present itself, but you intend on doing. Yeah, I think I think that it's like uh, I think that it's a maturity. Th Thing that will come with time, um, time and more writing and, and more projects out because I, um, I, I don't want it to be like a self-contained, I am writing a graphic novel and I've got to like mm. write the story, design the characters, draw them from all different angles and like figure out how the panel sequencing goes. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm just interested in the way that my mind flows naturally between language and images, I would love to publish something that flows naturally between language and images. And if that's just like, you know, a book where an essay goes for 20 pages and then it just starts to turn into diagrams and then they turn into drawings and it ends with a drawing on, on, on a page. And that's kind of like, it's just gone from words to images, but it's one essay in my mind. Hmm that that as an artwork as an art form for me is a lot more weird and experimental and true to the way i think than trying to like organize a graphic novel you know and and kind of like trojan horse my ideas into a format i got you that makes sense okay yeah so um that that's that that was that was my question there so so my my I'm, i won't keep you too much longer i just have a couple more for no, you no, um no yeah yeah what would you say, as far as the magic pieces go, or what was the smoothest one, like as far as from getting from A to B and just finishing it like quickly? What was the mm -hmm. easiest? And then what was the most one that gave you the most struggle? The lo most laborious? Laborious, yes. Um, I think Mystic Gate probably would be the would be the one that I just kind of like you know, painted for a couple of hours and went to the toilet and came back and was like, oh, it's done. You know, <laughs> that's cool. Glad I took a break. Um, there's, there's probably ones that went even quicker, but I think it was the, it was the one that, that really felt like an achievement to have done it so quickly. I was like, I, I did it quickly and it feels really good. And it's really nice that I'm actually noticing that I can stop at this point because I would normally just continue and nitpick it. And it was like, no, I actually noticed that this is done. And it's nice. It's nice to like, you know, go home at five o'clock for a change. Right. Um, right. The, the most laborious one. I'm trying to think like I know I know the problems I know the problem is always when I go too dark I mean definitely the most labor intensive one was the sculpture but it was yeah. also fun the yes. ones that are like really grinding are the ones where I I go too far into a certain tonal range and then I don't notice and everything kind of collapses into darkness and then I've got to kind of like pull everything back out again huh. um so oh, I'm trying to think of, of a good example. 
because it seems like, at least for me, just like um, for cursory looking at it, it seems like light is always such a, a important part of your pieces that that mm -hmm. I, I, I'm surprised that you would get trapped by that because you always seem to have such a, a very uh, established lighting uh, set up in all of your pieces that are, you know. Pretty, yeah, I, but I think it's I think it's that what I was talking about before of it being quite a um, quite an organic process for me where I just kind of like let things emerge from this kind of textural soup and I'm just kind of like raw shacking things out and pushing and pulling. The downside is that like if if you don't luck onto a good solid structure or or kind of like tame the horse as you go and you really go too far in one direction, you, you might miss it because you're just kind of going with ah. the flow, you know, which is also my, my incredibly Piscean nature to, to, to do that, to go with the flow. But I mean, looking at the, um, at my work on my website now, I, I remember Arid Mesa having that problem in the oil paint itself. Like there was, there was a significant part of the images in, in shadow and just like the the darks were really sinking in and I kind of had to keep pulling the the light back out in the painting. Um, creeping tar pit as well had a bit of that, had a bit of that issue. Yeah. Like that I one's look at them and I'm like, you know, I kind of like resolve them all in the end somehow, but the, but the, I remember the labor and even actually even the, um, even the vertical, um, the, the full art lands, the, the skull swamp, the, um, um, yeah, this, uh, what set was that? The full art vertical. Um, was Zendikar uh, or Zendikar Rising? No. Um, no, no, it was um, the one with the gold. Uh, it says the Unset, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the Unset, right. Um, that, I just remember that like they were, what they asked for was just very kind of quintessential mountain, quintessential island, like no specific setting, no specific world just make a very islandy island, a very mountainy mountain, but give them some kind of design language that makes them look like they all fit together. And so uh -huh. I was like, okay, I kind of had these like spiraling, sweeping um, compositional lines that go through all of them. And it's a particular kind of shape of curve. Yeah. But I remember it. I remember just getting completely lost in, in the tweaking of these curves. Cause it was like, if one didn't line up perfectly with where it kind of, jumped from the mountain into the cloud it would make it look wrong and then changing that would make the other one look wrong and it just became this kind of visual tetris that that went on forever so they, yeah sometimes, it turned out amazing sometimes the ones that sometimes thank you <laughs> sometimes the ones that look really really kind of simple and and not um not kind of technical are also the ones that take a long time because when there's no obvious focal point or or kind of like obvious priority in the image then even the little background details and things become important so yeah how has the pandemic affected you since you are somebody who traveled so much who likes to go out likes to do things that are it's it's very important for you to be out and about for your own you know art, not just mm -hmm. like personal sanity but for your art how did you how did you deal with that um so i think like we were pretty we were pretty fortunate in in Germany most of the time. I mean, I think every country has had its um, you know it's it's a it's seemingly lucky moments, and then you know like oh here we are again, wave number whatever we're up to now. <laughs> but I think for for a lot of the time, Berlin managed it pretty well, especially in the last um, in the last you know since the second wave until now, they've just had a crazy amount of free rapid testing everywhere. So they were, they were able to reopen uh, a lot of outdoor events over the summer. So I was able to go and continue my work a little bit. Um, but it, it still affected it. I mean, you know, everyone wearing masks means you're, you're one more layer removed from that interactivity, that kind of that, that connection and facial expression and everything like that. I've also been able to do a little bit of travel, but again, not in, not in the way of like really deeply getting into a new place and, and meeting people that live there. So yeah, it's, it's definitely taken the edge off. And I've, um, I've been quite content to be in my studio. I've been quite content to be working, but I've also noticed just kind of a natural drop off in my level of motivation to, to, 
to just kind of like make art for fun. I think that I think it really requires a stable and privileged position to be able to just sit down and be like, I'm just going to sketch in my sketchbook for a few hours. And I think being in a in a in a condition um, that you know, unfortunately, the rest of the world I think is very used to of like you know anxiety and needing to just constantly be kind of paying attention to what's going on. Um, yeah, it, it removes that ability to just kind of, um, well, not removes, but it, it creates an impediment to just drawing for pleasure, or it has done for me. So I've noticed a drop off in my desire to just jump into my sketchbook at night before I go to sleep and doodle and sketch and, um, and play. But it's also given me, I think, a lot of focus, a lot of time in the studio um, where I've gone deeper into my work, I've gone deeper into researching materials and um, gotten a little bit more nerdy with um, sort of chemicals and oil painting, different mixtures and stuff like that. So it's, it's been a really nurturing time for um, laying some new foundations. But I do notice that my main practice, which is drawing in public, um, has has not been there for a while. So um yeah I was, I was having this conversation with my girlfriend today for a few hours actually of like how do i how do i actually reconnect to that and 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 um it it you know it's going to come back but it's going to have to come back in a new way um for me to feel like it's a new stage of my practice so that's maybe a very complicated answer because i guess it's it's still a a thing in progress you know but yeah i mean I, I didn't expect you to be like oh well everything was fine i'm good I'm just gonna make <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that was um, you know that was the that was the meme in the beginning you know it was like when when people were going into quarantine all the artists were like oh well you know spending every day inside and never seeing the sun like story of my life mm -hmm. to me it was like no that's not the story of my life at all you know like like my story is is having to force myself to stay in the studio to complete work because what I really want to do is be out there, you know, originally landscape painting and then doing this more human centric stuff. So yeah, it was, and I was also running a business called Legendeer in the States before, um, before COVID and we were doing, you know, annual events with 20, 30 artists going out to the national parks, hiking, you know, doing, doing education stuff out there. So building that community and doing those events was incredibly um deep and emotional and rewarding and that that just got completely cut so that was yeah. um, that was a pretty big blow i read that you moved thir to 13 different places like within the span of like a like a short few years and i i mm -hmm. I'm, i would die i literally would just like <laughs> kill me and they say that the three most stressful things that people can go through is uh death divorce and moving and and how mm. how do you how do you do that without like just losing <laughs> it I mean, I guess because I, I always moved around a lot, I think the, the stress of moving is, you know, when you actually have, you have a house, you have a lot of stuff, you've kind of built a life somewhere. And then some, for some reason, for a job, for, for whatever reason, you kind of, even if it's your choice, you're kind of compelled to move. For me, it was, um, it was usually the path of least resistance. It was, you know, kind of like starting to feel static in a place and starting to kind of build up possessions. And then I'd feel like this is, this is actually going to become a bit of a trap. My expenses are going up and I would actually travel to kind of like spring clean, get rid of stuff, you know, um, downsize a little bit. Um, and I did that for many, many years. And I think Berlin was the first place that I, I kind of landed and thought I actually want to stay here. Right. Okay. And I also, I also realized the need at some point to, to create some kind of stable base if I was going to really produce serious work, because there's only so much, you know, I wanted to scale up my paintings. I wanted to do more sculptural work and, um, and also like develop better inroads into the communities around me. So I started to feel like a little bit dilettantish and like I was kind of bouncing off the places that I went to and never really going deeply enough into them. So that was a very, a very conscious choice to stay in Berlin and really invest in that, um, in the world that I was studying and form those relationships. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause you like had a said natural progression, I guess. 
yeah, you had said that you didn't like to keep uh, that you you weren't into like creating like the the whole idea of like making a framed paintings, like just sort of doing a show because of your nomadic lifestyle. And it, but it sounds like mm -hmm. now you might be open to that as as something that's a possibility. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I think that when 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 you mature as an artist and when you have a bit more resources, I think it makes more sense to to have a base and then travel with with you know, explicit intentions and, and actually project based travel instead of, you know, backpacking around and just absorbing, absorbing. And I, um, you know, I actually, there was actually a very specific moment that I was traveling in Spain and through a series of coincidences and kind of, uh, Yoda mentor moments, I ended up, um, kind of unknowingly being, given the address to the house of my favorite painter, uh, Antonio Lopez Garcia, by a by actually like an old student of his who was himself in his 60s. And I said, to, I was studying, doing a workshop with him. And I said, you know, I'd love to go and see some of Antonio Lopez's paintings when I'm in Madrid. Um, do you know where I can see them? And he wrote this address down for me and I thought it was a gallery. So I went off and I'm like driving, driving to this gallery and I'm like seeing Madrid disappear behind me and the buildings are getting lower and lower. And I'm like, I don't think this is a gallery and <laughs> right. I turn up and it's his house. Um, wow. And so com completely unexpected. And so I you know, knock on the door and he's like, who, who are you and why are you here? And I kind of explained how I'd accidentally turned up at his house and he was like, okay, come in. We, we have a chat. And I went in and spoke to him for a few hours and had probably the clearest kind of spiritual moment of my, of my art life. It's this guy at the like absolute apex of his, his um, life as a painter and um, you know, me being so unprepared for it, he was basically like, okay, like, tell me about you, tell me about your life, what's going on. And I'd kind of been on this journey around Europe, you know, connecting to the history of painting and trying to figure out like, what's the point of this? Does it really do anything for the world? Does it help anyone? Like, what's the point of art? And, you know, and, and he was this kind of like Yoda level guy that, that was just kind of listening to my story and nodding and, you know, obviously recognizing when he'd been at that point when he was young. And, and, uh, at one point he said to me, like, you know, I was saying all the places I'd lived and all the painters that I'd met and all the things I was trying to do. And he stopped me and he was like, you've done enough. He's like, you know, you have enough experiences that you could go into your studio for the rest of your life and make good work. He's like, I'm not saying don't do more, but you've done enough. <laughs> like you don't need any more experiences, any more mentors, any more people to meet, any more places to see you've done more than enough. So I, I really took that message to heart. And I think, you know, eventually that was what triggered in me the okayness with settling down in a place it was like, I don't have to keep moving and absorbing and absorbing. Um, and in fact, if that's all I ever do, then I'm just going to absorb a lot and never make anything. So that's an astonishing um, story. Yeah, really, really amazing. And, and, you know, I, it like the, the end of the conversation, because I was very anxious, like I, I, I well, yeah, I was, I was expecting so much. It was kind of like the one chance to meet this, this guy, probably the last time that I'll be able to meet him. And so I was kind of like getting really like anxious inside and, and a bit desperate to kind of get an answer out of him. And he was like, what's your question? You know? And I said, like, what's the point of art? Like, I just want to know, like, what is the point for you getting up every day at your age and painting? Like, what is the point of all of this? And he just kind of smiled, closed his eyes. And he just wait, like waited and waited for my anxiety to build up. And then he was like, art is pointless. You know, it and it's just like, and it just like this structure inside me just kind of collapsed and like all of this expectation collapsed. And he said, you know, because it's pointless, there's no path for you to follow. Like get that through your head. Like there is no right answer. There is no point to any of this therefore you're free like now you can do whatever you want and that's going to be the most important thing for you and it just kind of like did this kind of reversal in my brain of this kind of young attitude of the seeker to like actually you're not going to get an answer to this question you're just going to have to do it you know and i was waiting for the right answer of what art what the point of art is 
to decide what I wanted to do with my art. And he was like, get over it, man. Like, you're never going to get that, that answer. So that was, and yet um, you did, you did get the answer. Well, the you answer, got the was, answer was for, like, that it was pointless. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, the point is that it's pointless. So yeah, a typical paradoxical Yoda moment, but um, yeah, that was it. And it, and it really did. Like I had this kind of soul crushing moment where I sort of like saw the structure of my, of my uh, inquiry collapsing. And then it was replaced with this kind of like flood of um, excitement of like, wait, like now I can go anywhere. I can do anything. Like there's no rules to this thing. You know, it was like really overwhelming, but at the same time, it felt like stepping out of the, the kind of adolescence of being an illustrator into the like, Oh, like I'm on the, I'm on the ocean. I'm on the ocean waves of like being a real artist. And that means that I can completely tank. Like I can fuck this thing up and it doesn't matter how, how well respected I am as an illustrator, how much money I make, like none of that is going to matter if I don't do something that's really personally fulfilling to me. So the risk is much higher, but also the freedom is much higher. And it's like really up to me now, like which way do I want to go with this? And so that sounds very, that sounds exciting. That's, that's really exciting. And, and I mean, again, what a nut, that's nuts that somebody just yeah. like, I mean, did you ever find that person again that gave you the address? Do you, did you afterwards? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, come well, up to yeah, yeah. We, we, we have a, we have a, a, as good of a friendship as a Spanish person who doesn't speak English and an Australian right. person who doesn't speak Spanish can have. <laughs> right. I'd be like, I, I got to send you a box of chocolates or something. Cause that's a really um, amazing joke. You just played on me. Like, like <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, before, before I let you go, um, the final question I have for you is, I know you cannot give out the specifics, but what, um, are there, um, how many cards do you have, uh, in the works for any upcoming magic sets, do you think? Uh, there's probably, I imagine there's usually about 20, 25 pieces that I have that are unreleased. Damn. That's a, yeah, that's damn. So yeah. that's, and I've tried, I've tried to do, um, I guess my, my pace is slowing down a little bit because I've tried to jump fully into traditional painting, um, at least for, for card art. When it's, when it's like, you know, packaging or promotional stuff, um, I tend to do digital because it requires a much higher resolution and, um, and a lot more detail and tweaking than the card art does. But I'm trying to go full traditional um, and, and uh, not have such a separation between my my you know digital work and my fine art stuff and kind of bring them together so i'm slowing down the number of commissions that i take um but i'm still doing i'm still picking up you know quite a lot of extra commissions and um yeah so plenty you, of stuff you, i think i completely missed um the um, the innistrad set I don't oh, think really I, anything. I don't think i have anything in that well, but after that bomber I'm back on track because you had so many great lands in the Innistrad. I was like wondering if there was going to be like the trequel, <laughs> the trequel uh, <laughs> to uh, the, like the, the lands. So that's a, that's a bummer, but oh, yeah, well, I'll I, live. Uh, no, I, I was taking a break. Uh, I took a break. I think that was a really, they, they went really quickly through the commissioning of that. And I was kind of surprised that I think I took a break for like a month and then I came back and like Innistrad was done. And I was like, well, that was quick. Uh, wow. Because you know, I thought they'd kind of pull me in on the back end of it, but yeah. Well, but, you know, the, the stuff that I have coming out actually is like, uh, is a lot of, um, it's a lot of, I mean, there's, there's basics and stuff like that, but there's also a lot of really quirky different pieces. So yeah, a lot of stuff that I'm really excited to, 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 to get released. That's awesome. And have you ever, do you, have you ever kept any of your originals or the, did you sell all of them? Um, no, they're pretty much all, they're pretty much all sold. Like I, because I, I was, uh, I came pretty late to doing the traditional work for magic. Uh, I don't know why, considering that I was, that I was always oil painting. I think that I, I just didn't, I wasn't confident that I could hit the same level of finish in the deadline. And so I just kind of always shied away from it. Um, but no, because yeah, I don't have a huge back catalog of stuff. So pretty much everything that I've, um, that I've done that's gone up for sale has gone pretty much straight away. Um, I guess because, you know, the people that are interested in buying my work, a lot of those people still don't have a piece yet. So. Yes. And uh, they're, they're, it's, they're incredible to see. So um, thank you so much for doing this today. It's, it's been great. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Really happy to do it. And uh, thanks for the, the interesting questions. Oh, thank you nice, for the nice interesting when someone's answer. interested to go into the, into the fine art side of things as well as the magic stuff. Thank you, thank you too very much. All right. Well, what did I tell you? Isn't he cool, cameraman? Yes. 
And... What did you want me to say again? What? I didn't want you to say anything. What are you going on about? Oh yeah, you are the coolest. No, no I'm not. Yeah, you're the coolest. No, no, just, just forget it. It sounds silly now. How did you turn your phone back on? I didn't. Now that's cool. Shut up. <laughs>